a science illustrator. And this is the first episode of Draw My Science, the video podcast where I interview scientists and I draw awesome illustrations based on their work. In this first episode, I'm interviewing Walter Delisanti, a PhD student at City and Kong University studying corals metabolism. Can you believe it? I didn't even know corals and had any metabolism. So in this interview, you will learn a lot about corals and a little bit on how it is to live in Hong Kong and the best place in the world where to go diving. On the screen, you'll see me drawing in a time-lapse fashion. So there are all the drawings that I made for this, uh, for this interview. And in the comment down below, I'm leaving information to where you can find my website and all the illustration in full resolution. And if you are a scientist and you want to participate, please uh, reach out. There is also information down. So without any further ado, let's dive in. Hi, Walter. Well, welcome to Draw Hello. Your Science. How would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name, where you're at in your career stage and what you're doing right now. Yes, thanks for reaching me, Valentina, first of all. Um, yes, my name is Walter or Walter. Um, I'm currently a PhD candidate at City University of Hong Kong. So uh, basically I'm at the end of my PhD study and I'm studying the coral metabolism. So basically I'm interested on uh, what corals are doing underwater and the physiological status of corals and basically how they can respond to natural fluctuation in the water. So just to introduce myself a little bit, I'm from Italy and living in Hong Kong since three years now. And Yes, I got a degree, a um, master's degree in marine biology. So always interested in marine organisms, marine environment in general, marine ecosystem in general, and then focusing on organisms and physiology of organisms. I started before with microorganisms, and now I'm focusing on something a little bit bigger. What were you studying before, specifically? Specifically, before I was studying how microorganisms can, uh, how microorganisms respond to ocean acidification. So I was studying basically plankton communities uh, under ocean acidification. What's all the ocean acidification for? Okay, ocean, ocean acidification is a process uh, caused by uh, uptake of CO2, uh, atmospheric CO2 into seawater. So okay. basically, um, CO2 reacts with uh, seawater and through a series of um, chemical reaction, uh, we have a release of um, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen ions in the water. So this lower the pH okay. of seawater. Of course, it's, it's a long term process. Is mainly due to anthropogenic activities. I mean, uh, right now it is a natural process, but right now due to anthropogenic activities is um, increasing the level of acidity of seawater. Okay, just to translate is that basically whatever is related to global warming and how our footprint of bringing more CO2 into the atmosphere. Is that, exactly. is that correct? Exactly. Okay. Okay, great. And now you're working on coral metabolism. Is that related to the desacidification process or is something completely new that you're um, studying? Actually, I'm not focusing only on acidification problem. Of course, corals are in, in, in the ocean, so are affected by multiple stressors. Okay. Um, what I'm focusing exactly is I want to know um, what corals do under certain conditions but not uh, putting them under stress but more specifically i go underwater and then go to measure some specific uh, some biological processes so um, i correlate the change of biological processes with uh, env natural environmental fluctuation more specifically for example in hong kong we have um, hong kong is particularly 
um, special area for um, corals uh, because it's not a tropical environment, so it's not the typical environment for growers to grow, but we call it as subtropical environment. So it's a kind of uh, extreme environment for corals because okay. we have season. Uh, we have season basically, you know. So, so we have winter and summer. So the, the just step back. So the the coral ideal environment will be tropical environment. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And yes. then whenever you deviate from that condition, that's already a source of stress, or it's just different species of coral. How does that work? Uh, both actually. So in in the normal condition, um, we have. I mean, in the normal condition, corals can live, can survive in in the natural fluctuation. So, for example, uh, corals live in the tropics. They prefer uh, warm water and more saline water. So mm -hmm. basically, salt water and usually currents because need to bring some nutrients also and, and clean water every time. But in Hong Kong, instead, we have uh, winter and summer season. So we have dry season and wet season. So okay. we have basically uh, during the summer, for example, we have high temperature and, um, and heavy rainfall due to wet season. And during the winter, we have cold water and dry season. So this kind of natural fluctuation, of course, is affecting corals living in Hong Kong. And we have different species uh, rather than those living in the tropics. Mm -hmm. But in, we, basically, we say that corals living in Hong Kong are, are highly resistant to natural fluctuation. But what I want to know is how they can adapt to this okay. natural fluctuation. So they, they're not... I, I, I'm assuming they're not so different than, than the one in the tropic that is obvious how they can survive. Is that right? Yes. And how many species of coral do you study? Uh, I'm studying right one species, specific, one species in detail, and I'm trying to compare uh, now another species, so maximum two species only. Okay. Uh, because this is kind of pilot study, uh, so maybe in the future we can use other species. And just out of curiosity, do you know how many species there are around Hong Kong area? Is that yes, very we, variegated? Yes, we have a lot diverse? of species of corals, actually. No, um, only a few people know that we have a lot of corals in Hong Kong, and we have maximum around... 150 species, okay. considering all hard corals, soft corals, black corals, and gorgonians. What are the four it, things you mentioned? So there, are, you say hard, soft, and then are, are the two other two names? Can you just black. can you just briefly tell us what they are? Oh, basically, is morphological differentiation of corals. Okay, it's very very easy. Uh, hard corals are the common hard surface coral. Okay. Okay. Um, soft corals are um, soft surface coral. Uh, they have the difference is that they have the hard corals. They create the calcium carbonate mm -hmm. as skeleton. The soft coral has calcium carbonate secretion inside the organism. So the soft part is outside the animal. Okay. And black corals instead is still um, similar. It's a similar coral with a black uh, skeleton. Okay. What, what does it give and the color black? Is that a different type of carbonate or is it? It's, it's, it's actually it's a different mineral. Yeah. Okay. And and then gorgonians also is another type of. Uh, of another type of skeleton, basically. Okay. So another type of calcium carbonate. So the, the common is... the common thing that defines corals is this skeleton structure, and then on the, di the depending on the difference between these different species, then you have these categories. Is that right? Or uh, yes, of course, it's not just that. It's yeah. Not only yeah. This, but yes, too. If we want to make it easy to, simplify, to understand better, just, yeah. yeah, just to yes, get, yes, yes, get yes, it accessible course. to everyone. Okay, sorry for interrupting you. So you're back. So, no, what, no. Type, 
What type are you studying this time? So I'm studying a uh, reef, um, a reef, um, how they call it, uh, like a building, reef building coral, a uh, boulder shape. Commonly named is brain coral. Okay. Brain so coral, it's that sounds fun. A boulder shaped coral and very simple structures like a, like a boulder exactly mm -hmm. with some some signatures like brain brain shape okay so in this coral this species is uh, widely distributed in hong kong so it is believed to be a highly highly resistant species and also it is it has a perfect structures of uh, for my study, because I'm studying the metabolism using a specific instrument mm -hmm. that is that was developed by some other colleagues, and so I'm using this instrument. I can uh, place this instrument directly on the coral surface. So since this piece is is, um, uh, is a flat surface, mm -hmm. it's easy to to use this instrument to be attached on the, on the surface. And so through this instrument, I can measure some, uh, basically, the biological activity of the coral. Such as, uh, what exactly are you measuring as a biological activity? Exactly, I'm measuring, I put this instrument on the coral surface and I measure fluxes of oxygen, pH, and temperature. Okay. In the dark and in the light. So I know I'm measuring the respiration, photosynthesis, and the calcification of the coral okay. directly underwater. That's cool. So a typical day for you is actually is not standing in a in a lab with a lab suit, is suiting up and going underwater. Exactly. The idea that you want to do with this through these studies is to bring instruments in the water to study corals instead of collect corals and bring to the lab. Why is it so important to do it this way and not bring it to the lab? What's the, the major benefit of doing that way? Because if you wanna um, if you wanna study corals in their natural environment, we need to go in their environment and we need to see what they are doing. Of course it's not easy, it's challenging. Uh, we cannot study all the corals underwater because we have obvious limitation to go to go and to stay underwater but i think it's one of the major advantages that we can see exactly what they are doing in the water and then we, we avoid the collection and we avoid to fragmentation of the coral so mm -hmm. um, we avoid to exactly to collect corals and bring to the lab in the opposite, of course, in the lab, we can do a lot of study, a lot of experiments, but it's always an artifact mm -hmm. of the natural condition. Do you have any control to double check what was the water, water temperature, water uh, parameters next to the coral while you're doing the measurement? Exactly, exactly. Of course, I'm measuring also chemical and physical parameter of seawater around the coral, okay. so I can, I, I know if corals are, is doing if my coral is doing under stress or they, there are something concerning about the health i like how you I call know. it your coral i, I think it <laughs> indicates a lot of passion I, I like that because yeah you know what because some species um my main i have a location that has reference site so I'm going every month to measure this, this, this measure to do my study basically. So I know that some colony, I selected some colony specifically. So like, it's like that I go to, to find my, my corals every month. And how does the, how does it work with the environment? How fast do they change? How do the fish population affect, uh, if they affect the population of coral? Is there anything that you can, can, can get a feeling when you go there and you, you already know what's up, what's going on. Yes, um, actually, it's, it's very easy to understand. It's exactly, exactly the same as we have perception of high temperature or low temperature or, for example, the perception of when we have fever, mm -hmm. okay, when we get sick, we, we, we feel and we know why we get sick. Okay, sometimes we have some 
infection, but sometimes it's just because we got cold. Okay, we, we, we have been exposed to low temperature, yeah. or at least lower temperature for us. And so we have some kind of stress. And this, for us, for humans, we can measure with, with a thermometer if we get fever. And we, we have some feeling that something is going yeah. on in our body. Okay, for corals, it's exactly the same. Corals have some, op, some range, optimum range of temperature. So, uh, of course, depend on the, on the location where they are living. But if they, if we have some, uh, some days where seawater temperature is relatively higher than, uh, than the, no the normal, they start to have higher, um, for example, higher respiration rate or photosynthesis. Something is changing in their metabolism. Mm -hmm. So we can, I can directly measure, I can detect if the coral is under stress in that moment specifically, or is still um, uh, is still uh, resistant to high temperature or low salinity events, for example. They can adapt very fast. So it's really within hours, within one day, they can adapt and they can change the metabolism. So do you do this is... Do you repeat the measurements on the same day or do you choose different time of the day? How does that work? We, since they are so fast, how do you mitigate that? Um, yes, of course, I got some reference because I had to do a preliminary study in, in the laboratory mm -hmm. before okay. because I had, to, I had to know what is what to expect. the timing. Yeah. You know, I, I guess I, I had to know what is the timing of uh, response from the corals. But right now, since we don't know how corals respond during the season and during the year. I'm doing monthly uh, measurements. Okay. So I go once a month on the same location. So I check what they are doing. Okay. Why people should you care about this? So of course, corals are beautiful, of course. but what, what, what's the important takeaway of this research? Um, one of the problems that we have with marine marine studies in general, I would say, is that people it's difficult to reach people, especially for environmental studies and ecological studies. Mm -hmm. This because it's very difficult to for us to explain our science and for people it's difficult to get in touch with the science. So um the takeaway is that first of all uh, about corals, that we need to protect corals because protecting corals is not just protecting one single species, but is really the entire ecosystem. With the corals, with healthy corals, we have a lot of, for example, fish that can use corals as nursery area for reproduction or simply for, for, for living. Or um, we have not just fish, we can have a lot of marine organisms. We have a lot of crabs, for example, um, any kind of organism. Not, of course, the main focus is about the edible fish. So this can be, can be um, very, very helpful for community living around, around the mm -hmm. ocean. And of course, mm, on the other side, we have a lot of, um, we need to protect, we, we try to send a message that protecting the, the, the marine environment is also uh, giving another opportunity to, for example, to next generation to enjoy the marine uh, ecosystem in all the ways, both from fishing, from enjoying uh, water activities, enjoying going, da going diving, uh, going to the beach, you know, all the kind of all, all activities. And of course, from my side, specifically from these studies, I want to just show to the people, first of all, we, we need to reach Hong Kong people, because Hong Kong, very interesting, is uh, very few people know that they have corals in their okay. water. So first of all, we, we want to reach people that to say, hey guys, you have a great environment over there. Of course, the environment is is under stress. We have a lot of problems. So, but and uh, on the same way, I want to explain them that what corals are doing 
in the natural condition and what corals do when they go under stress and where is the stress where does the stress come from okay no that that's a great re reply yes i guess we if you can understand more about the metabolism then we know how they work how we can uh, make the environment that it, an environment in which they are safe and they can grow and proliferate and have more biodiversity and all the type of things that I guess they come as a consequence long term of yeah, having more healthy exactly. corals. Um, you said two things that I want to touch base on this last uh, last bit. One is uh, that it's difficult to reach people about uh, marine biology or maybe more in general corals. I don't know if it's a sensibility towards coral or if it's in general marine biology. And you were the first one to reply to my tweet about Draw Your Science, which is, uh, I think those two things are connected. And I want to, uh, maybe I, I would like you to comment a little bit more and then I'll ask you my second question. Uh, yes. Um, I need to think about, actually. <laughs> because, yes, um, I am I'm always happy because I always work in, in, the, in the research, okay? Um, so I feel for myself, I feel how difficult it is to explain what I'm doing to uh, people working in another field of study. And even simply to explain my science to my family, okay, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. So I know that it's difficult to uh, explain, to, to bring the awareness to, to other people about uh, the marine ecosystem. So that's why uh, when I saw your tweet uh, and I said, "Oh, this this is a cool, very cool project," and and I like and I love actually the drawing part of of um, of your project because it can can really reach uh, all the people, can reach kids, can reach um, adults. And yes, in all, all the field, absolutely. And yes, I don't know if you. No, no, want that, that, that's fine. More direct. No, no, that, that's great. So that's the uh, uh, and uh, I I think it's interesting how for me the interesting thing is that uh, a lot of people they reply to the comment. You were very fast, which is uh, always it was very very pleasant on my side. But I, I, I think it's showing how researchers started to care more about sharing not only the results, but the importance of what they're studying. And, exactly, and yeah. I think that's a really positive change. And I, and I like how when you were talking about this, you were saying how important it is to reach people, to bring awareness. And you, you mentioned awareness a couple of times, which I think it's, a, it's actually an interesting concept. I go back to my second question. You, you also you mentioned that not many people know about marine biology, or they don't know, uh, and they, they are not aware of this type of study. How did you end up in as a marine biologist? What what motivated you? Um, all right, uh, I started diving a uh, very long time ago. I started diving almost twenty years ago. I was a kid. Okay. And Where are you originally got... from? In Italy? It's a place near the sea, if I can ask. Yes, yes. I'm from. I'm from. My city is called Barletta. It's okay. uh, nearby. Uh, yeah. Near Bari, southeast. Southeast. Perfect. So yes, basically, of course, always get in touch with the sea, with the beach, and, and yes. And I got my first diving license when I was just twelve. Oh wow. Okay. And yeah, and it was really for 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 just like just playing basically, and I got the opportunity uh, to, to to do the um, the dive try, and of course I was with my parents. I said, and really my first impression to breathe underwater, even though it was just a pool, for me was really discovering a new world. And I said, okay, I wanna do the uh, diving course. I wanna learn how to go on the water so this i guess was for me my my turning point uh, of course then i completed my studies and when i had to decide to go to universities i already know 
that I would like to do marine biology. Mm -hmm. So I first took uh, biology as bachelor and then marine biology as master degree. So I think, um, and this is particularly um, for going back also to the previous question, this is particularly a turning point because as I felt what is the, the feeling of breathing underwater, um, if we can bring more people, not just underwater, but even just swimming into the sea, they can really recognize how important is uh, environment protection and environment um, or, or everything related to the ocean, everything related to environment. Because I think people don't care because they cannot see what is underwater. That's a very okay. nice, nice idea, yeah. So, um, uh, yes. So I think um, using, of course, we cannot bring physically all the people underwater. <laughs> so that's why also I, uh, I really enjoyed to join this kind of project for science communication or science uh, awareness um, that, that are always, uh, I mean, I like it, yes. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. So how many different, that, that's just out of curiosity, because now I'm getting jealous, I never dive. <laughs> I, 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 know to, <laughs> I know how to swim and uh, I should definitely try. I have a lot of friends that do diving and I should. How many, in how many different sea or ocean or place have you, uh, have you, do, have you, have you done a diving expedition? Because uh, Bali is the Adriatic Sea or the, but let's say it's on the Adriatic or the Ionian? Yeah, no. Adriatic Sea. Okay. So that's one. Hong Kong, I don't know what's the name of the sea around Hong Kong, if it's directly the ocean or if it's something um, else. Hong Kong, Hong Kong, we call Hong Kong Marine okay. Ecosystem. Is there any other general. place that you have uh, you, you've done your diving expedition? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, of course, uh, many places around Mediterranean Sea. Okay. So between also west coast of Italy, that I, I think is one of the, still one of the best places of the world. <laughs> and and of course uh, Red Sea and Indonesia and yes back to Hong Kong. What is your um, favorite so far? I think I think Italy is the best. Italy is the best, <laughs> so still the best. <laughs> Italy is still the best, yes, absolutely. Because it's yes, I mean of course as everything. When you live in Italy you don't recognize the, 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 the strength and the power of Italian environment and I can say for marine environment of Italy. Um, of course, it's very different between East Coast and West Coast, but the West Coast around uh, Tuscany for me is one of the best area for underwater, yeah, underwater environment. That's good. Tuscany is one of my favorite regions. So next time I'm there, I know, uh, I know yes. that I also have to do some diving. <laughs> Um, you gave me a perfect segue for my next question, that is uh, how, it, because I, now I want to talk a little bit about you and, and you as a researcher, how it is to live in Hong Kong, how it is to be so far away from home, is there a culture shock, and um, well, how do you, you, you've been there for three years now, do you feel part of yes. the culture? Um, difficult question, <laughs> and this, this I think goes out of science discussion now. Um, well, but you know, you know it, science is very, it's becoming more and more international, so I want to bring also the aspect and, and show how, because I think one aspect of science communication is to show that behind the scientists there are people, and I think that's why I, I, I'm just have, I don't have that many questions about uh, something personal, but I think uh, especially the multiculturality of science, the interconnectivity of science. I think that's some, one point that I, I want to touch. And I, okay, just okay. your personal um, opinion, nothing... Uh, okay, okay. So, um, it's completely another world, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I can say that we can have um, a lot of opportunity. Um, Hong Kong, 
Hong Kong is really a region, very multicultural region. So you can approach any kind of people from any kind of sector, any kind of field of expertise. From even for me, I, I, can, I can, of course, I can tell you my experience. For me, not only focusing on marine biology itself, but I can be, and I'm actually be in contact with, I don't know, for, with engineers, with uh, designers, with um, any, 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 any other field of, that I could combine together with, uh, with some other activities still about marine, uh, um, marine uh, education or awareness and whatever. So I think Hong Kong is, is a great, uh, great opportunity for young students or young researchers that want to start to have some, um, that want to start to think open-minded about science in general. And yes, that's absolutely, absolutely, it's, it's a great place. Yeah. Okay. And of course, for example, we have a lot of universities. We have at least six, seven universities mm -hmm. in Hong Kong. So um, sometimes the work is overlapping, but still have chance, still have a way to collaborate with other people or get in touch with other other researchers. So it's it's a very very innovative and and yes, very very nice place for for science for sure. You think you're gonna stay after the PhD, or what's gonna be uh, what's gonna be your next knows. step? Do you know already? Do you have an idea? Uh, not yet, because I'm planning I'm planning to do some uh, research exchange back to Europe. Okay. Uh, still studying coral physiology and coral metabolism, uh, but in another way. Um, so yes. That will be the last step of my PhD, the last okay, step. Okay, and then all is open. He'll decide after that. Yes, yes, no rush now. And, uh, still, That's still good. didn't think yet. Yeah. Okay, we have reached the 30 minutes mark. So right. well, I, I think I'll let you go to speed up and go check on your corals. I don't know if it's that day, <laughs> that's the day of the month in which you're going to do your uh, your check. Can you go and share to the world where people can find about you or about your research? If you have a website, a Twitter account, if you can tell us right now. And so Absolutely. Uh, I don't have a, a personal website yet, but of course, Twitter and Instagram uh, I use mainly. So just look for my name, Walter Delisanti, and just can find all some information. Twitter and Instagram, that's perfect. Yes. Okay, Walter or Walter, what's what's the right pronunciation? I think overseas is Walter, or but in Italy, Wal yes, Walter. Walter. Of okay, so I'll call you Walter. <laughs> okay, thank you, Walter, so much. That was fantastic. I didn't know so many things about corals, and I, and you have great, you have shared a lot of things that I didn't consider. Because when I think of marine biology, I always think that is, uh, I don't know. I, as you say, it's not something that crossed my mind that many that, that, that often. And I think uh, bringing this type of awareness of how important it is to study, uh, to study and to see uh, what's out there. To, uh, yes, yes, exactly. I think that's, uh, that's fantastic. Welcome back. I hope you really enjoyed this format. It's the first time doing anything like this, so please leave down below a comment with your suggestion on how you can improve it. I know the audio quality wasn't perfect, so any recommendation and suggestion is really welcome. And I'll guess I'll see you in the next episode of Draw My Science. Bye! And you should you should think to take a diving course. Oh yeah, I'll definitely will because you made me so jealous of you. Now I really want to do it. <laughs>